What's up, ladies and gentlemen? Welcome to another episode of the Real Estate Marketing Dude Podcast. Uh, folks, we're here with a rock star, a legend. You might have seen his name all over the damn place. This guy knows what he's talking about when it comes to investing in real estate. As a matter of fact, he already has invested and runs and maintains a billion-dollar fund. So I'm going to get right to it today because I have a lot of questions for him. Uh, mainly around um, which way the market's going. The reality is a lot of people listen to this show are in real estate, they're in lending. 90% of y'all have never even seen a market that shifted in this capacity, in this way. And a lot of people don't know necessarily how to navigate that either. But where there's doom, there's gold, not gloom. Because when you know how to shift and play and navigate these different types of waters, and you listen to someone like who I'm going to introduce to you in just a minute, pay close attention and take notes because... Um, when the market shift is often when people get really rich. I mean, I think this is, would you agree with that, Neil? <laughs> I mean, that's where well, a lot absolutely. of these, that's where a lot of the opportunity comes in. So let me go ahead and introduce our guests and uh, let me give you a proper introduction. And I'm going to line up this because we got all kinds of questions for you today. All right, Neil, Neil, why don't you introduce yourself? Who are you? Where are you from? What do you do? Let's go. I'm a technologist. I'm a data scientist. I come from the Silicon Valley culture, and it's my job to disrupt real estate, disrupt real estate development. We publish massive amounts of data for free on 323 metros in the United States, and we rank them for real estate investing. We give that data away for free. Uh, there's no subscription. There's no upsell. And as a result, we've managed to gather a bunch of uh, nerdy, geeky you know, folks, mostly you know, doctors and engineers and technologists, who believe that real estate investing should be data driven and those folks have given us 300 million dollars of their money uh, about a thousand investors to both buy and build uh, various different kinds of real estate in the united states we're hot on apartments student housing built to rent uh, but we also do self-storage and industrial i love it i i We've had a couple people on the show with the self storage space. Now my mind was blown at some of those just different conversations. Um, but let's start with the data because I agree, data is where everything goes. Data never lies. The numbers never lie. Um, and in general, I know you do a lot multifamily. You're doing a lot of stuff in the commercial market. Let's stick to residential uh, just for this mm -hmm. question, and I'll go to yeah. the next one. Uh, but from residential, what does the data say? Because I, what I'm seeing, I, I subscribe to Cobesi letter. I like reading mm -hmm. their their posts a lot, right? And I'm seeing high uh, loan defaults on, on on cars. I'm seeing high. Act I'm seeing in our data, we're seeing a ton of stretched out uh, credit card debt, um, mm -hmm. mispayments just starting to happen. Um, a lot of people will be like, "Hey, is this going to be 2007, 2008 all over again?" Um, and uh, what do you say to the answer? What's the data say, collectively speaking, to um, then and now? Let's first do the economic piece, and then I'll talk about real estate, right? So the economic yeah. piece says that we are definitely on track for a soft landing. I don't feel like this is 2007. I think it's fashionable to say it's like 2007 because you always want to be the person that said, hey, five years ago, I told mm -hmm. you, so I'm not going to go there. Before we continue, let me take 60 seconds to tell you about Multifamily University. Are you ready to take your real estate investing to the next level? Look no further than Multifamily University. Our comprehensive resources, including guest podcast appearances, educational webinars, the Real Estate Trends Toolkit, and the Location Magic course are all designed to make smart investing easy and accessible. Plus, with no subscriptions, no upsells, you can trust that we're always looking out for your best interests. But don't take our word for it. Check out what our satisfied customer, Carlos M., had to say. Neil's presentation was filled with invaluable information that is not readily available to the average investor. This group takes you to the elite level of investing. Join the ranks of the elite with Multifamily University. Join us at multifamilyu.com and start investing from a place of knowledge today. Not only will you have access to a wealth of knowledge from industry experts, but you'll also be able to stay ahead of the game with our in-depth analysis of market trends and potential recessions or corrections. Invest with confidence and make informed decisions based on data, not gut feel. Don't miss out. Visit us at multifamilyu.com today or click the link in the description below. And now back to the content. So I'm, I'm looking at the data and I am absolutely amazed at the unemployment level. So we're at 3.9% unemployment. We produced 322,000 jobs in February. This has been recorded in March um, of 2024. And when I'm looking at that unemployment rate and I'm looking at the fact that inflation's come from 9% down to 3.1%, that shows us that the Fed has done its job. And 
everyone likes to beat the Fed and I'm actually no different. I love to beat the Fed, but in this case, I have to grudgingly admit that the Fed has actually been right. Um, it the Wall Street thought that we would have seven you know, cuts this year. Then they thought that we had six. Then they thought we had four. And now they think that we have three. Guess what? 18 months ago, the Fed was saying we would have three job cuts, uh, three cuts in 2024. So for the moment, one has to grudgingly admit that the Fed has been right. The economy is moving towards a soft landing. A soft landing is not fun, just so you know what the definition of a soft landing is. Yeah, can you define Basically, that for us? Soft landing means that the growth of the US falls to almost zero. And that's going to happen in Q3. That's going to happen in Q4 of this year. So the second half of this year is going to feel really shitty. It's going to feel like a recession. You're Right now, you're seeing, if you go back and look at the last three months, job growth has been you know, 200,000, 300,000. Well, you're going to start seeing that job growth fall to 100,000, 50,000, 80,000. Those are very low numbers for a country of 330 million people. So when you're only growing 100,000 jobs, the economy is basically uh, at a stall state. And you're going to see that stalling happen in the second half of the year. And that's what the Fed wants. Because as you get close to a stall state, demand dries up. If there's no new jobs being created or very few new jobs being created, who's going to create the demand? Who's going to spend the money? Well, if you don't spend the money, what's going to create inflation? Because there's no competition for new goods. When that there's no competition, that brings inflation into the twos. And that's the Fed's job, to bring the in inflation down into the twos, two and a half percent range, so they can achieve their soft landing. So we're going to see some fairly shitty conditions in the second half of this year but I don't expect the economy to go into a recession, which is negative growth, right? So the rest of the world is ahead of us. So at this point, Germany, the UK, Japan have already gone into recession. China is slowing. India being the bright spot of the world right now at 8% GDP. But when I'm looking at it, all of the other countries are, are ahead of us. The United States is actually the, the primary shining spot with our stock market staying high and our job growth staying high, but that cannot last because people are like, yeah, but the Fed isn't increasing rates anymore. Imagine this, when you've raised interest rates by more than 500 basis points or 5%, imagine a 200 pound weight sitting on the chest of the economy. Well, that 200 pound weight has been sitting on the chest of the economy for a year and a half, and it mm -hmm. was its heaviest for the last seven months. The Fed hasn't raised interest rates for the last seven months, but you still got a 200 pound set you know, it weights sitting on the chest of the economy and that's dragging and slowing things down and it's slowing it down just right. So speaking of um, rates, um, what are we looking at? You just mentioned it, you know, we're, we're supposed to have more cuts. We did not We did, or you know what? People don't really um, know what to expect. Well, There's so far I'm looking at the Fed dot, dot plot and that shows three quarter point cuts, one in June, one in September, one in November. And I think that we're going to get those three rate cuts this year, and then we will have an accelerating rate cut next year. Once once inflation's down to two and a half percent, then the Fed can accelerate because that's not interested in keeping rates this high. There's this nonsensical, very social media driven myth that the Fed, the rates are going to stay high. Why would rates stay high? Have you seen how rapidly world growth is slowing? Population growth is slowing. Yeah, it's crazy. The world's getting older. And as the world gets older, it consumes less. People who are 65 years old consume a lot less than people who are 45 years old. So when you look at demographic trends, when you look at large scale trends in the world, all of these trends are leading towards deflation. None of them leading towards inflation. Perfect example, Japan, right? Their stock market last week hit the same number that it hit last in 1989, which meant that basically for the last 25 years, right? Oh, well, in the last 35 years, their stock market has been down from where they are. Why? Because their population is getting older, right? They have a very, very low birth rate. Their population is falling. And so Japan has stayed a great country in those 35 years. They're still a magnificent economy, yeah. still number three in the world. So they, they haven't crashed and burned, even though their debt to GDP is double that of the United States, double that of the US. They haven't crashed and burned, but it has meant deflation in their economy. They constantly have to create inflation in their economy to keep things going. And so when people actually come in and say inflation will stay high, there's no data behind that at all. Interesting. This is good stuff, Neil. Very good stuff. Uh, I, I, I'm sure I know what, the, you know, what our listeners are doing. Things pull like, in two different directions, right? Yeah, so like the Ukraine does. war was pulling in the direction of energy being expensive, which means inflation up. But the rest of the world, when you look at the world, there's maybe... With the exception of the African continent, everywhere birth rates are falling, everywhere growth is slowing, everywhere people are getting over, everywhere consumption trends are going downwards. Inflation is simply a factor of demand. 
And if in 90% of the world, growth is slowing, demand is slowing, how do you create inflation? I can predict that in two or three years, we'll be trying to create inflation. Interesting right? And take. by the way, I want to sh share a data point with Please. you. Right? Yeah. Forget, forget what happened in the last 24 months, because we all know that this inflation was created by a break in supply chains and the ridiculous $4 trillion that we injected into the economy like idiots. Right? If you hadn't done those two things, let's look at what happened to inflation 10 years before that. All of the things that people scream and yell about were happening for those 10 years. But inflation in the United States was under one and a half percent for the 10 years before COVID, right? So all the bad stuff that we're talking about, money printing, it was happening, right? We were doing quantitative easing. It was happening. Inflation was at one and a half percent. The Fed was struggling to get it up to 2%, right? So look at the Fed struggle, study those things, go out and stare at charts on the St. Louis Fed website to understand that in the real world, right, economists have challenges and their biggest challenges are not supply chains because those are obviously fixed. Those challenges are that we are not producing enough babies. That's a problem. How do you fix that problem when the world is 100 million babies short every year? Wow. So this is a big picture. And it, you opened up saying, I'm a data scientist, which is interesting. So I haven't had anyone on the show actually come on like that. It's like, I'm an investor. I'm a data scientist. And I, I love that um, approach. So let's now, I think we got a good picture of the economy here. You got the good worldview here. What's yep. going on? Can, overall, what we're saying here, guys, is so you're tracking at home, consumption is down. And with consumption down, demand's down. With demand down, then you know this is how it all eases out into inflation. Now, in terms of real estate and investing and or whatnot, um, what are you guys doing right now? Where do you see, uh, based on your data, um, your brain? I don't know what the hell's going on up there, but there's all kinds of gears turning right here. <laughs> what not? What's happening? What do you get, Where do you see the opportunity? Where are you going? Where are you advising your investors to go? So for the for the moment, the single family and multifamily markets have diverged. So single family and multifamily are the two largest asset classes in real estate. Nothing else comes close in terms of large asset classes, right? Yep. They've diverged, and it's an interesting diversion. Um, since interest rates started rising, single family homes in the United States are up about three to 4%. So they've gone up, right? So it's been slow growth because we are talking about a two year time frame where you know prices have gone up by two or 3%. So you're talking nationwide, you're doing nationwide, general, right? Nationwide, yeah, okay. right? So it varies, so, you know, uh, the hot boom towns are down a few percent and, uh, and the Midwest markets and the Northeast markets are up more like 6%, but the overall yeah. average in the US is about 2% up. In the same exact time frame. Multifamily prices in the United States are down 20 to 25%. Once again, varying by metros. Some metros are down 10, 12%. Other metros are down 25, 26, 27%, especially the boomtown metros like Phoenix, which have oversupply. So bottom line is, normally, single family and multifamily track together because they're dependent on the same sort of things. But because single family has something that multifamily doesn't have, the lock-in effect. Remember what happened is with multifamily, we all were tied to addicted to bridge you know, lending. So we were basically taking floating rates. Whereas yep. with single family, 99% of all homes that were purchased in the last four years were purchased with ultra low interest rate, 30 year fixed loans. Yep. That locking effects means that 20 to 25 million American families like me, I have a 1.75% mortgage. If I go somewhere, my mortgage jumps from 6,000 a month to 15,000 a month, right? I can't go, I'm locked yeah, in. You're locked. So, 25 million families are locked in. That's keeping supply ridiculously low. And that's put a floor under single family prices. They're not going up, but they're not going down. And they probably won't go down for a number of years, especially now that interest rates slowly over the next year will start to come down. So as they start coming down, affordability will actually improve on the single family side. And I think that the single family market, here's, here's my prediction for the next five years, just stays where it is. It's going to stay where it is and might go up 1%. But it won't go up as fast as inflation. If inflation is 3%, single family might go up 1%, 2%. Why? Because it was supposed to drop like multifamily. Multifamily dropped 25%. Single family didn't drop because of the lock-in effect. And you think so that 100% for the lock-in effect for that reason. At this reason, point in time, it sort of, it, it, it's hit a plateau. It stays near that plateau. It might go up a little, it might go down a little, but it stays at that plateau. So over five years, the lock-in problem is solved. Because over five years, we'll have maybe 15% inflation. If home prices stay the same, well, in a way, they're coming down 15%, right? Because they're supposed to go up with inflation and they didn't. So if, if the price of a single family home in the United States five years from now is the same as it is today, 
well, then we fixed the issue of them being too expensive because of inflation. They should have gone up 15%. They didn't. Well, yeah. so we've sort of fixed that issue, kind of fixed it. I'm in, now, uh, I'm, right? I'm in Southern California and I got here in 2017 mm -hmm. and I literally seen the prices go up literally. Cause I watch this all the time. I'm on Zillow. Like, it's like, what's going on here? What's going on here? 40% all day um, in San Diego area. And like, it, it's crazy. And it's hitting affordability ceilings, right? So the yeah, big question it's is- nuts. They can't go up any further because That's the average seeing. mortgage in the U.S. has gone up 112% in the last three years. So once again, from the start of COVID to when we are recording this, the average mortgage in the United States is up 112%. The average salaries in the U.S. are up 19.7%. How do you reconcile those two things? How do you, because the banks won't give you a loan. The banks, lenders give you a loan based on your income. So if your income's up 19.7%, but your mortgage is up 112, wouldn't that put a ceiling on what yeah. you can pay? And we're yep. seeing that ceiling across the United States, not just in California, we're seeing it everywhere, right? There's... And 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 California is a mar market known for busting through those ceilings and it's still just, you know, it's like, I can't get through There's that There's nowhere because... to go. Like exactly. literally, and even, I'm even seeing the opposite effect too. Even the people that uh, have rented their houses are, are sort of like reconsidering, like, why would I sell this? I have like a 1% rate. You know, like, why would I ever sell this? And then, yeah, you're, you're, there's no inventory. But um, do you think that some of these high areas um, like Southern California, Phoenix, Austin, um, some of the areas that just really, really boomed, do you see a correction um, in these areas I, in residential? And then how about for so, multifamily? So the, the, the you know, when we look at, you know, and, and I've been researching this for single family, when we look at the risk in the marketplace, the risk is actually very tightly contained within certain very expensive markets. There's a number of them, three of them in, in California. Uh, and then you're looking at markets that are very expensive for their income, like Austin. Uh, yeah. Austin might be saved if its income shoot up all of a sudden, because there's a lot of demand there. Uh, you know, it, you know, the population growth, home price growth, income growth in Austin is much higher than California. So maybe they work their way through this, maybe they muddle through it, or they see a decline. But if the decline happens, even in California, I do not expect it to be double digit. So in the San Francisco Bay Area, where I live, this is the most expensive metro in the United States. We are seeing a decline, but the decline, interestingly enough, and I would not have predicted this, is happening mostly in the $2 million home. So what, what in the Bay Area, million dollar home price prices are still selling like hotcakes. I live in Fremont, California. And so I looked at three homes that were sold in the last 30 days. They were all above a million, 1.3, 1.4, 1.6. .1 and they had lots and lots of offers. But the homes that are above that $2 million range in the Bay Area, and maybe above a million dollars in other metros in the United States, they are the ones that are likely to suffer simply because people can't afford them. They can't get a loan for those. Yeah. It's the same situation here. You buy, you could buy the same house or rent the same house for the difference per month is probably like eight thousand dollars. You're like, yeah, it's, well it's, a, it's a shocking it's, it's, number. It's so a, it's, it's crazy. You know, I want to share that with you. The difference between the average rent and the average mortgage payment in the United States is the highest in history. There's a lot of people saying, "Well, the rental market's not going to do well." Right? How do you reconcile this statement? The difference between the average mortgage and the average rent is the highest in history. It crushes 2007. How can this not be a good time to rent? How can this not be a good time to buy a land, be a landlord when that difference is the highest in history? We, in, in the last three years, the United States- good way to, That's a very yeah. good way to put it. You might say that one more time just so people can hear that because the difference one of the biggest- The average yeah. mortgage payment, including, especially if you include taxes and insurance, and the average rent for the same property, for the same exact property, if you rent it, that gap is the highest in history by far. That gap, gap is now over $1,200 a month nationwide, probably four to $6,000 in California yeah. per month, right? <laughs> At least so, 100%. 100%. so obviously California is the worst case example of all of these things, and so is New York. But yeah. nationwide, $1,200 is a huge number. The gap between rents and mortgages has typically been $200, $300. If you look at history, five years, 10 years, 20 years, that gap between renting and buying is a couple hundred dollars. Now it's over a thousand dollars and that's an insane growth. And so that number will adjust over time as rates come down. So mortgages will come down a little bit because of that, but rents will also go up. So combination of two things will fix that. Rents going upwards and mortgages going downwards. I'm not talking about home prices going down. I'm talking about mortgages going down because interest rates will come down over time. Yep. 
What about investing wise? Um, what I would think, you touch? I see. Uh, and then uh, here's a question I have for you because I didn't know these numbers either. So I just want to repeat something you just said. The single family uh, home appreciation last 12 months has gone up two to 3%, very modest, right? But at the same time, the multifamily um, but properties have depreciated 20 to 25%. And I remember right. just a couple of years ago, uh, there's all kinds of gurus buying, buy this, buy this, syndicate, 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 right? And I'm how many people, what's the exposure? How many people have been caught with their pants down? Because that's a big like if I'm a syndicator and I got into that bubble, how big is that issue? And there must be a huge opportunity to go buy these assets that were bought in too high. Am I not seeing that correctly? Or There are 3,000 assets in the United States that are distressed. At an average value of 30 million, the total distress in multifamily is $90 billion. 3,000 multiplied by 30 million is $90 billion of total distress. Now, these properties are not worthless. This is in 2008. So yeah. they're, they're probably worth about 65 to 70 cents on the dollar. And so when, was, when were these purchased? Like, where do you see this bubble from? The these last are three properties to five years? that were purchased in the second half of 2020 and the first half of 2021 and the second half of 2021. So basically wow. purchased over an 18 month time frame. Why are they in distress? Because they all have bridge loans, right? Now there's a huge number. I mean, multifamily is a very and large market and there's no distress in the overall market, but in the syndication portion of the multifamily market, at least 10, 20% of all properties are distressed. And folks, just so you understand what, he, what he's saying, just if you're following, I know a lot of you guys watch it, listen to this when you're on your treadmill or you're working out or whatnot, it's that when that bridge loan hits, they're locked into a low rate and that's going to adjust to whatever it's going to adjust to. Or to, has already adjusted. Or, or is already. And then now right. that that property that was cash flowing is no longer cash flowing. It's 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 uh, right. It's negative cash flowing and it's costing Correct. money. Therefore, the value is not there. That's what we're talking about. Um, and that's many, what's driving the prices down 25%. So- yeah. I mean, you ask me, you know, what do I invest in? Well, I, I invest in two things. Number one, right now I'm investing, I'm buying multifamily. Two years ago, I was on every podcast in America telling people, this is insanity. Do not buy. I'm not buying. I'm penciled down. My team hasn't underwritten anything in months. Nobody was listening. I mean, I, I was being made fun of on podcasts. Like as the, the, the Dr. Rubini, the gloom doom man of, you know, multifamily. Well, you know, we saw how that worked out. So Right now, I don't have 10 properties that are upside down. I have one, right? I still bought some properties. Um, and so I won. I dealt with that. I, and I raised pre uh, pref equity to, to make that property get a, a fixed loan. And so now it's cash flowing. So I fixed that problem. But I, I don't have to deal with 10 or 20 like many of my syndicators. You sold up. To deal with it. You saw it coming uh, in and you let, you let them go? Yeah. It, to me, it just made, it made sense to stay away from the frenzy that we saw two years ago, right? So I was very lucky to have stayed away from it. Bottom line is today, I am on the hunt. Today, my investors are saying, yeah, you saw this coming, good for you. And you send us all these emails and we didn't listen to you. We invested with seven different syndicators. Now we have six cash calls. And so yeah. we're coming back to you and now you're on the prowl. So right now I'm in predator mode. I'm going out and making offers on dozens or hundreds of properties. I'm focused on the ones that have assumable low rate loans. So for example, we just bought a property that had a 4% fixed rate because you know the 25% discount is only there because of one reason, interest rate. Yeah. So if I can get the discount but not have to deal with the interest rates because I'm buying an asset with a fixed loan, how can that be bad? That, that has to be an incredible deal. So I'm incentivizing my team to find assets that have assumable loans with a minimum of three years left on them and that are fixed loans. So I'm not buying a million dollar rate cap. Yep. So I'm not wasting money on these stupid rate caps. That is number one opportunity. And here's the second opportunity. And this is really for people that want to invest in, you know, may maybe don't want to invest with people like me. They want to invest themselves. People like the, the people who um, two years, three years ago paid too much for the properties. Those people are now having to recapitalize, meaning put more equity into the properties to take them from a 10% bridge loan to a 5% fixed loan or 5.5% fixed loan, right? Well, the best deal today, me as an investor, as a personal investor, is to put money into that. It's called pref equity. Pref equity is ahead of the common equity. So the property has six, seven, eight, nine million dollars of common equity. And if you do your underwriting right, and this is a good property, so the property is good, it has done well, it's caught at the wrong time, those properties, putting money in at pref equity and making 15%, 14%, I will do that all freaking day long. Because that is uh, that is like 
lending, right? Lending is supposed to be lower risk than, than investing in equity. Well, pref equity is kind of like lending. So right now I have a three person team. I'm actually gonna read this from my calendar on the left here. Gather pref equity opportunities, 3.30 to 4.30 PM today. My team will come in and present pref equity opportunity, opportunities, not for my company, for Neil Bawa to invest in. Like it. You're a smart dude, man. This guy is smart, he's sharp. Um, and follow him, man. Uh, really good stuff. This is this is really interesting. So I didn't. I'm the thing I'm most shocked about is the the multifamily. I'm I'm not in that space. I don't know it very well. I just see what I see on social media, and to see those numbers are uh, um, insane. Um, twenty five percent is the la largest discount we've seen in multifamily since the eighties. And and what's amazing is we're seeing this discount with an economy under four percent unemployment. So it's just the rates. I mean, I expect multifamily to bounce back very strongly. I listened to Blackstone today. So Blackstone's head of CRE, this is a company with a $100 billion asset. Yeah. They're sick. Here were the words out of his mouth. He said, this is a generational opportunity to buy commercial real estate. It's only cheap because of one reason, and that reason goes away in the next two years. He says, we see it as a general oppor gener generational opportunity. We were not engaged two years ago when everything was expensive. Now we think everything's cheap. And so we're buying a lot. He's also doing things like, they're also buying out uh, office because office is you know, going to go down 40, 50%. Yeah, it's down so about 20 to 30%. Places like New York, it's down more. Places like San Francisco is down more. So Blackstone's saying, I will happily buy offices at you know, 40 to 50% off and I will hold them for a significant amount of time and then do adaptive reuse. Maybe we turn some of it into apartments or condos or things like that, yeah. uh, but we wanna buy at a low basis. So it, I am very, very excited by the fact that investors are extremely disappointed right now. They are very fearful. The last two years have been bad for them. They've had cash calls. I love it. I love it because they are my competition. I don't want competition. I want to be able to make 50 low ball offers and have somebody accept a 30, 30% under market offer from me, which is what's happening all the time these days. So I love the fact that all of the investors out there are terrified. That's, you know, I've read a lot of uh, things. One that stands out that you say that is the, what Buffett said, you zig, you zag, I zag and they zig. And honestly, everyone who's doing the opposite of what everyone else is doing are usually the ones that are always the ones winning. Um, not at the current time, people are probably gonna think you're crazy like they did the first time, but um, obviously you've proven them wrong. Well, what um, I what I do is, I mean, I have a group of about 25,000 people that are following me for data. So what I do is I release data every week or every month that gives them confidence that I'm following data, I'm following systems, I'm looking at the last five years, 10 years, 50 years, and I'm understanding market trends. Then when I bring out a project, they are still hesitant. They're shell-shocked with what happened in the last 24 months, especially with multifamily. But eventually they realize this guy is taking advantage of it. And so enough of them give me money. We just bought a $30 million property with a, a Zoomable loan. It's down about 25, 35% from you know, peak value. And it's, I'm not saying that it's 35% it's discount. It's probably... 15% discount, right? Because some of those values were too high anyway. They, those were probably yeah, yeah. crazy values. So, you know, I, I'm not saying my property is 35% off of its value. It's probably 15% off of its value. But the beauty of it is there's no downside. It's already a locked in loan for five years. It's already interest only. I don't have a rate cap to buy. So I'm just getting a discount because the market's back, right? And I love that. And we, we did this raise and we thought this is going to be a really difficult raise because it was $9.8 million and we had about 90 days to close. And it just flew past. People understand that this is a good time to be a predator. This is, uh, you know, back then, I was really big in the 07, 08 short sale days in the single family market. And everything that you're saying right now is just feels like it's what's happening in the commercial in that frame it's, it's, like, it's, like, it's like like yes. that whole wave because like I, I in hindsight i was too young man i was like 27 you know wake, making too much money didn't even have the discipline to invest or even think about the future no kids well, you know i, I mean? was buying a property Crazy. every month in 2008 and my family when they realized what i was doing they banned me from all of the family parties because they thought i would infect the other men in the family so for 18 months i was not allowed to go to a family party Why? because you know I, I live in a family with a big don who's kind of the big big shot. You know, he, he helped uh, us come here from India. 
Yeah. And so he was he was the guy that everyone kowtows to, including me, you know, because he, he made my life. And he said, no, you, you're not showing up here because you're infecting these people with these stupid ideas. And by the time I had 18 of those properties in my pocket, everyone was listening. Man, the only way to do something to get people to, to do pay attention to you folks, and this goes for you too listening, is that prove it and prove it with action. Talk's cheap. Um, well said, Neil. This is a really excellent show. Why don't you tell our listeners um, where they can find you guys, uh, if you have anything for them, um, any other closing thoughts you want to add. Um, this is very insightful. The floor is yours. Yeah. We publish single family and multifamily data on an ongoing basis. It's highly entertaining, very interesting. We also publish data about things like the nonsense around the dollar's demise. We publish data on how climate change is changing real estate. We publish data on how artificial intelligence is changing markets around the US. This is all very, very entertaining. These are hour long webinars. They're data driven, uh, lots of charts, lots of graphs, but also some fun. Um, and 25,000, you know, slightly nerdy, uh, you know, day geeky investors come in and learn from us. Only a thousand invest with us. So the best way is really to join that community. It's free. It's always free. There's no subscription. There's no upsell. There never will be a subscription. There'll never be an upsell. The website is multifamily followed by the letter u.com. So that's multifamilyu.com. Go there you'll see an amazing toolkit and that'll give you all of the metros in the US that you should be investing in right now. Step-by-step, step, we, we rank 323 metros. Our top 10 are in there every February. I like it. Thank you for your insight today. And thank you folks for listening to another episode of the Real Estate Marketing Dude podcast. Mm -hmm.